one man with one microphone who loves growing succulents. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another session of the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Now, in today's episode, I wanted to discuss something that has cropped up of quite a few times in my career and it appears to be cropping up for other people too and uh, I've I've had people emailing me asking me my thoughts on this so I thought actually maybe I'll turn this into a podcast episode because it's a pretty important matter and it's the matter of contracts. Now I just want to put a disclaimer at the front of this episode saying that this is of course not legal advice, this is my opinion based upon my experiences. Now if you do want to seek legal advice of course go and find yourself someone who specialises in music contracts etc etc etc. Now the discussion today isn't sort of going into the fine details of contracts, it is covering a specific point of those contracts and that is exclusivity to one publisher or to one uh, music company, production company, whatever it is. It's exclusivity versus non-exclusivity. I think it's a bit of a contentious issue. Um, So I'm going to approach it from kind of two angles. So I'm sort of quite privileged to say that I, I have experience both as a composer and as somebody who pr- uh, produces and publishes music for other composers as well. And uh, here are my thoughts. Now, I have had experience personally with exclusive contracts, uh, and I didn't come out of it thinking it was a great idea. Now, the thing you've got to think about is, you, you know, obviously and ultimately... Um, when you're dealing with this type of stuff in your career, you have to weigh it up based on your experience and your instinct, right? So here's what happens. You get in touch with a publisher and you say, hey, I've got these great tracks, you're going to love them, based on, you know, your releases and what you guys do, really fits with me and my tracks, here's, here's a little taster for you. They listen, and they go, they are blown away. They say, oh my goodness gracious me, that is possibly the greatest music I've ever heard. We would like to get you on board as a composer on our books. Here's the deal. And the deal is, you would be exclusively working with us as a composer, which means you are not able to write for any other companies during the period Uh, in which the contract covers. Uh, That's pretty much the basic idea with an exclusive contract, that you can't write for anyone else. You have to only write for that one company. Now, as a composer, your first question you have to ask is, are they going to be able to bring you in enough money to warrant that contract being signed? You know, are they going to guarantee, which they won't because they can't, an income that's going to um, cover your bills, cover your mortgage, cover your rent, cover you know your your living costs, because it's really important. You know, at the end of the day, we need to be bringing in money, uh, and if we can't do it, then it makes composing a lot harder, especially if you're stressed about money. Um, and it's a really, as a composer, I look at that and be like, well, why do I need to sign an exclusivity contract? Why can't I write for other people and bring in enough money so that I can keep doing what I'm doing? Uh, so my my gut for exclusivity contracts, unless they can sort of or have a history with you as a composer and you know that they'll be bringing in the money and if you've kind of gone over the sort of 80-20 principle that actually the 20% of the work that you give them gives you 80% of your income already then maybe it's a no-brainer. If, however, you're starting out and it's the first kind of library who's who said, yes, we'll sign you, but you'll have to be exclusive with us, you have no experience with them, they can't guarantee you income, and in the meantime, they're kind of 
tying you down to only writing for them, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is all libraries and publishers are not the same, <laughs> you know? I have experience writing and working for many libraries, many publishers, many uh, agencies, and they are not all the same. And what I mean by that is, firstly, th at the end of the day, they're people. You know, if you get along with them, great. That is a huge deal, you know? And the other thing is... Uh, the fees. They don't all charge the same fees. Some libraries I know of land huge blockbuster trailers, but they charge peanuts. <laughs> you know, so you go, hey, I've just landed this massive Hollywood trailer. Oh, I've only got that amount of money. What? Whereas some land really small trailers and the fee is much higher. And these things, unfortunately, you don't find out until you start working with the publishers and the libraries that are, you know, in this industry. It's, um, you know, and there's that aspect. And then there's the aspect of working with them as a composer. You know, you have to have experience working with, with libraries. If I had to jump into bed with one library and I hadn't had experience in the process of writing for them... I mean, that would be terrible. I mean, the amount of libraries that I, I haven't enjoyed working with because of the process of working with them, not because they weren't nice people, but just because the way they fed back or, you know, how how they critiqued my work. You know, it's like teachers at school. They're not all going to be good at teaching. And these guys aren't all as good at getting the best out of you. That is their job, is to get the best out of you and some people approach it differently. And you need to find out which way you like best. The way I like working best is to send sketches that give an idea of the mood or the tone. And then Vic, who is, you know, I pretty much do work exclusively with Vic at Elephant Music. Um, not that I am exclusive, but just because he brings in all the money, you know? compared to the work I did with other other people. Uh, you know, with, with, where our relationship is really fantastic. I send a sketch, he, he kind of gets the idea, and he knows that I'll deliver a finished track in the right vein, whereas some libraries do not like a sketch. Some libraries want a finished track that they can then sort of get really in detail. You know, this snare, you need to up the EQ at the 800 mark, you know... Uh, this this triplet here, its timing's all wrong, you know. They get really, really detailed. And that works for some people. It didn't work for me. I didn't enjoy that. I, I like broad sweeping, you know. Is this in the right vein? Yes. Go. Woohoo! You know, I, I like it to feel quite creative and loose. And I like to think that's how I, as a uh, library owner, library co-owner, I should say, um... That's how I give my feedback, encouraging people to write to their strengths and encouraging the best out of them. And again, this, this doesn't unfortunately come unless you start working with the people. So if you're getting a contract right off the bat for exclusivity and you haven't worked them yet, well, you know, you sign the contract, you write for them, and you think, oh, blimey, this isn't that fun. <laughs> I don't want to join this. Uh, you need to make sure that in that contract there's some way of, like, ending it. Sharpish. <laughs> you know. Um, now, I just want to also cover something. There's, I'm not covering exclusivity of rights to the music. I'm covering exclusivity to you as a composer. Most libraries, if you write for them, they will own that track exclusively. It's, that's the way it works. We're providing a service. We're going, here's our track. Let's split the copyright. Some libraries do buy the copyright, um, which is another podcast episode altogether. Um, in fact, I'll probably record that after this one. Some libraries buy it out altogether. But what I'm talking about here is their rights to you as a composer, you know, how much you can do your work for other people. Now, my personal belief is there isn't a need for an exclusivity contract. And I'm saying this as a composer. There isn't a need for it. The only need comes now, where I put my library owner hat on, right? And I'm saying, OK, I've got this team of composers, and they're blooming great, and they write really original, fantastic music. But I don't want them to write original music for other people, because then 
I lose my, you know, unique selling point. My music's going to be in other people's libraries. So that, so for me, the exclusivity comes out of an insecurity. You know, that's the only reason that I think I would suggest signing someone exclusively to make sure that they don't write for other people. You know, you could say, well, surely you're just investing in the composer. Uh, yeah, you could say that if there was a sort of a hefty advance attached to the exclusivity contract, which, let's be honest, there never is. Here's an advance of one penny. <laughs> Great, thanks. One pound, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, as a library co-owner, if I were to offer someone an exclusivity contract, I would, you know, I'd feel bad for it, <laughs> for this composer. I'd, so I, I would probably r put something in there that's like, yeah, I guarantee that you're going to be producing this much work for us. Because that's what I would want. I would want it to be a mutually exciting deal for them as it is for us you know signing someone exclusively and then being like yeah okay you're just gonna do one album a year two albums a year whatever right <laughs> that's not exciting and that limits the composer and i don't think that's necessarily a fair thing to do you know i think i think personally i think exclusivity contracts are kind of like uh uh, are harking back to the to the olden days uh, of of how the music industry used to work, and now we have music industries. I don't think an exclusivity contract is needed and necessary because if we think about the idea that libraries are doing it to kind of like lock down their talent, like I know for sure that all of the, like the top. 20 trailer composers when I say top 20 I mean the ones that land the biggest or land the most frequent write for loads of libraries it doesn't weaken the libraries because as a library owner it's not necessarily just the composer's talent that we're locking in because it's a teamwork you know it's a collaboration they are writing and as a library owner you are producing them you are getting the desired brief out of them. With some exceptions where, you know, you'd just basically be like, you're an amazingly talented composer, do me an album. Um, so it's... I don't think it's necessary. You know, you can work with lots and lots of libraries and then find out which one is earning you the most money and then dive deep into that one, into that library, which is exactly how I worked. I worked with loads of composers, and I'm uh, sorry, composers, and loads of production companies, libraries. So I was doing corporate work, I was doing ad work, I was doing trailer work, I was doing feature film work. I was doing all this different work. And then you can, then you have all these sort of sources of work coming in, and you can say to yourself, "Well, what's what's bringing me the most money for the least effort?" So, for instance, uh, there was a library company I worked for where the 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 amount of feedback and the length it took for feedback processes to happen took such a long time. You know, there was one album that took twelve months because of the feedback process also because i was losing interest so i was getting slow on my feedback slow on my responses um and because of that i i could i could kind of see well actually this stuff i do for elephant music it takes me far less time because of the really smooth writing process and the fees are fantastic uh so this is a no-brainer for me i'm gonna drop all the other work and go all in and the moment i did that hey, my income went uh, through the roof. So you need to kind of weigh this up yourself. My advice is you need to be very careful about exclusivity contracts because unless they're going to bring you in the big bucks and really represent you, you know, really give you a, a, a pedestal to stand on as a composer, there's no need for it. You know? So... Take a step back from the contract. If you've been offered an exclusivity contract, weigh it up for yourself. You might say, actually, Rich, I feel like working with this library is the library I respect the most, and I feel like they're going to teach me a lot about the process. Then do it. I'm not going to, like, uh, I'm not going to look down on you for your own decision. You're on your own path. 
This is your life, your journey. You make your decisions. I'm not going to judge you for that. Everybody makes their own decisions based on their own experiences and own desires and goals. If signing exclusively with one trailer company is your bag, do it. And then you do yourself the justice and do the honourable thing of giving 100% to what you're doing. You make sure that what you're doing, you dive deep into. Because the danger, the other danger of not, of being non-exclusive, is that you say yes to every offer. Now I have exper- experienced this, experienced this as a composer and as somebody who is publishing other composers. If you say yes to everything, you spread yourself thin. You suddenly start taking ages to respond to emails, you suddenly start taking ages to respond to feedback, you suddenly are late for deadlines, and then all of a sudden, the work dries up. Because you think, as a composer, you get overwhelmed, you get stressed, you you become less effective as a writer, and then, you know, all of a sudden it's been six months and you've basically done nothing. And as a library owner... Well, this guy's taking ages to just to get the feedback, get the track finished. Uh, whereas these other composers are smashing out tracks every single week to a high quality. So we're we going to dive deep into these... That sounds really rude. We're going to... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not dive deep into other composers. That sounds awful. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Invest. Thank you. We're going to invest in these these guys and girls because they are really invested in us. Remember, it's all about relationship. You are investing in a relationship. That library offering you an exclusive contract is an investment in you. So although you can look at it cynically, yes, they're investing in you. They want to have the best team possible, and they obviously see something good enough in you, which is great. But weigh it up for yourself. Is this the best option for you? Does this library do what you really want to do? Is working with one library what you really want to do? You have to ask yourself these questions and you have to be really honest. Because, you know, I myself, having dealt with an exclusivity contract, you get resentful. Because, what you know, what happened to me was I signed the contract and it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then they brought on another couple of composers who were better than me at doing what I do. <laughs> So I stopped getting the work, which sucked. Uh, And then obviously I ended the contract because it was like, well, this isn't working. Uh, I'm not good at this. Uh, You know, and it, you know, it doesn't have to work out. You might be the other composer that's better and gets all the work, which is great. For me, that didn't happen because that was my journey. You know, for that, that experience made me avoid any exclusivity contracts going forward and made sure that there was, you know, exclusivity was a term that I very rarely read or heard um, because I wanted to be a free agent, man, you know. Now I've tied myself down to my own library, really, haven't I? Uh, So there we go. Um, Anyway, I would like you to think about it. I mean, if you if you haven't any experience in the exclusivity contracts, have a think about it. What, how would you feel if you were offered a, 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 to work exclusively with one library? Would that be an honour? Would that be like being chained down? Uh, would they? Would you? What would you want from that deal? You know, if if someone was to offer me an exclusivity contract, I'd say, right, okay, you have to guarantee the current income I earn, because <laughs> otherwise, what's the point? And also, I have to have some experience working with you first, you know? It's kind of like if someone... It's kind of like being headhunted, really, isn't it? If, if, you're, if they're kind of saying to you, hey, come to us, work for us exclusively, you don't necessarily need to see it as like, a, oh, my gosh, they're giving me the op- this biggest opportunity of a lifetime. You, you could flip it on its head and be like, actually, they want you. And, you know, I do know composers who offered an exclusivity contract and said, no. Shoo, go away. Which I personally think was the right decision for them. And since then, they've gone off and worked with loads more libraries, got loads more placements. For, as far as I can tell, healthier sync fees. So, 
go and judge for yourself what you think is the best. It's just a really interesting discussion, either way. And it leads me on to the next podcast episode, which is going to be all about uh, royalty-free and sort of back-end payments and copyright. Because I think that's another really fascinating subject. Um, But yeah, I'll save that chat for that episode. So thank you so much for listening, guys. You're absolute legends, and all of you sending me love over email, that sounds awful again, you know, sending me praise and thanks over email and stuff, lovely to hear from you all. Remember, if you do have the time to write me an email, I would love it if you could turn that email into a review on iTunes, just saying, you know, how much you're getting out of the podcast, give me a, you know, a a, a rating, And, uh, yeah, I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, And I do always, even if you're not doing that, I do always appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to this. So, have a nice week, chaps, and I will see you in the next episode.